Friends, I gotta say, I am often wowed by our community's generosity with their time and their talents. We might automatically and naturally think of artists and musicians, but there are so many of y'all behind the scenes who are making this church thrive. Our amazing tech crew, for example. <laughs> Up there, we've got Randy and Grace and Charlie. Y'all make magic happen. I don't understand it, but it just happens. <laughs> our ruling elders who oversee our many ministries, our congregational care deacons who really care for our community, the many of you who serve on committees and volunteer to serve with mission projects, BPC truly is who we are because of y'all. And yet this is not just a pep talk, although, hooray, <laughs> it is also a call to action. So hear what Jesus has to say about this well-known Sermon on the Mount. Hear this from Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under the bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we all know the song that goes along with this, right? This little light of mine. Are you ready? <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Get your fingers out. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh my gosh, there was harmony, y'all. Amazing. So, here is the question for us today. How are you letting your light shine? How are you letting your light shine? Now, if y'all know me, you know I like shiny, sparkly things. I mean, I, you know, dressed for it today. I like glitter. I like disco balls. I, you can't have too much sparkle, in my humble opinion. I know some people are not into glitter. I say more. We need more. But get a load of this. Scientists have speculated, and I read this on the internet somewhere, so I'm sure it's true, that people like sparkly things because our ancestors associated the sparkle with the light that reflects off of water and water is necessary for survival. So my attraction to glitter is deeply ingrained with the search for water back in the day. So it's a survival mechanism. That is why we go for things that are shiny and sparkly because it reminds us of water, which is a basic life source. So similarly, our ability to let our light shine, to be the sparkle, to be generous with our time and our talents, is how the church not only survives, but how it thrives, truly. But even more importantly, our generosity with our time and our talents gives glory to God. Our sparkle sends sparkles to God. Our sparkle glorifies God. It's like our way of expressing gratitude to God 
for the light inside of us and truly for our lives. It's a very privileged position to be in, to be able to give of our time and our talents. While we all have this light, we all have this sparkle, not everyone is in a position to share so freely, so if we are in a position to be generous in this way, we do so with gratitude. We do not have to look far to see places where people are put in positions of survival mode, either due to war and violence, or natural disaster, or abject poverty, or are migrants and refugees on the run for their lives. When there is so much suffering in our world, both near and far, the ability to give generously of our resources is an incredible privilege and one that Jesus commands of us. Mr. Rogers, well-known Presbyterian minister, he also had a children's show, would often share this wisdom that his own mother told him when he was a kid and would see scary things on the news. Look for the helpers. Look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping when bad things happen. And even in the midst of global crises, in really what feels like every region of our world, we find hope not only when we look for helpers, but when we are able to contribute to the hope and the light in this world. So with this in mind, I have been preaching this time and talent sermon for the last four years. So I figured this year, y'all would benefit from hearing from some other folks in our community who are actively volunteering their time and their talents. I felt like Brendan was a great appetizer for this sermon buffet. So I want to start with Amanda McReynolds and her mom, Tricia, they participated in the All Church Mexico trip that we just had two weeks ago. Y'all saw a clip of the video montage at the very beginning of worship. Don't worry, you will see it again. But uh, Amanda is a junior in high school, and Tricia recently joined the mission team, so I invited them to come share a little bit about their experience. I'm Tricia, this is Amanda, and we went along on the all-church mission trip just a couple weeks ago. Um, we went down to Mexico to help build a house for a very deserving family. Uh, we wanted to share with you what an amazing experience we, that was for us, and um, so what part of Jesus teaches is, is that we should give back to those in need. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, he says, Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Our family has always given generously to the church, but we felt like we could give more, which is why we decided to join the Mexico trip this year and, we, and give our time and talents for this long-standing tradition. It was an eye-opening experience, and it not only helped out a family in need, but it made us feel good, too. At first, I think my kids went because we as parents insisted they should. Amanda was worried about the school she would miss, and my son Kevin was worried about his snap streak. <laughs> but by the end of the weekend, they were both ready to go again next year. Amanda especially had an emotional moment, and I'll let her tell her story. Before we left for Mexico, I was apprehensive about the trip. I had a lot going on at school, and I was worried about missing a day on Monday. But seeing all the poverty as we got over the border made me realize the trip would be worth it. I couldn't believe the huge difference in living conditions when they are so close to where we live. Simple things to us, like running water, were difficult for them to get. When we met the family, they were super sweet and very helpful in helping us build the house. They made us feel welcomed and helped us every step of the way. We all felt like a big team by the end of it. I knew I had made some lifetime friends. By Sunday afternoon, when we dedicated the house to the mom and her sons, 
Seeing her tears and how grateful she was for her new home, I too shed some tears. I knew we were helping them towards a better life and I honestly couldn't believe we had done so much in two days. I truly believe this experience changed me as a person and showed me a different perspective on life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I want to invite up Steve Ruth, who is our former mission elder. He volunteers faithfully at the Hope on Union Food Bank down by USC. Hope on Union is a sister church in our presbytery and one of the many churches in our presbytery with an active food ministry that grew out of the need that arose during COVID. I will say Steve does many things, but I asked him specifically to speak about Hope on Union today. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. This was written on a refrigerator magnet when I grew up. To me, it states the peace and connection to God comes through slowing down and listening to that still and silent voice of, for what is really important in our lives. I aspire to embrace that internal peace by sharing my time and talents with others. As a child, my parents and family modeled serving others through church and community involvement. As an adult, I've been blessed by God to have a supportive wife, Cindy, two adult children, five siblings, and you, my friends at PPC. You all inspire me to give of myself and to serve others. One of the ways I practice doing this is by getting up early on Thursday mornings and driving to Hope on Union uh, near USC and downtown LA. I normally arrive at about seven and witness a long live line of recipients who have already been queuing up for some time. Uh, as a volunteer, I start by bagging up produce and then helping, other, or helping to get the pallets and boxes of food out to the edge of the sidewalk to distribute them. From eight to 10, we give out large quantities of fresh produce, fruit, type, some type of protein, and a variety of shelf-stable goods. The weekly distribution is given to an average of about 350 people per week, which is enough to fill a good-sized box or several, small or several grocery bags for each person. This food is shared by others in their family and equate, equates to feeding about 1,500 people people each week. Pastor Sonny Kang, who runs the uh, church there, has estimated that since the beginning of the pandemic, a total number of 75,000 people have gone through the line. Hope on Union also distributes food to other churches in this collective, including Westminster Press, Bethesda, Calvary Press, and Bellevue. It also needs to be noted that our presbytery in all uh, has other collectives at other churches, including Emmanuel Church, Wilshire Press, and First Hollywood. As reported to the, the LA Regional Food Bank, the number of people fed through all of the Presbyterian collectives has been estimated to be over a million people, including direct recipients, families, and friends. For Sonny, this number could be doubled as he often gets feedback that recipients also share the abundant amount of food given to them with their neighbors and people uh, that they know. Near, nearly every week at the front of the line uh, for the distribution of food to the grateful recipients is a man who's probably in his 50s. It's hard to tell for me. He's normally sitting on a lawn chair, bundled up in an old tattered coat, uh, and uh, he shared memories with me many times that uh, he's been there all night waiting for his food to arrive. He somehow has an old and battered smartphone which he holds on his chest uh, while watching or sleeping and waiting for us to arrive. A week ago last Thursday, he told me his phone was stolen while he was asleep. Last Thursday, he told me he thinks he knows who did it, but with encouragement, said he would not seek revenge, as he would have done many times in his younger years. He, he decided to forgive and forget. He had already bought another old used phone as a replacement and was moving on. 
I felt the presence of God in hearing of his peace, acceptance, and forgiveness. It seemed to be an acknowledgement that our treasures are not in the possessions we have, but in the simple things of life, such as food, warmth, and connectivity to others. Why do I share time and talents with others and pledge to be received? I have found that I get back many times the gifts that I have contributed. I simply need to show up, slow down, and be willing to get involved in helping others in their journey. The happiness and inner peace connected connectivity to God and others is priceless. Thank you. Finally, I want to invite up Linda Regan Johnson, who is our worship elder. She sings in the choir, plays in the worship band, plays keyboards, leads two small groups. Is that all? Maybe. Linda, thank you. Hi, everyone. Well, when I first started serving as a young, in my early 20s, um, I come to new to a Presbyterian church, and I had ulterior motives. I noticed that the happiest, most fun, friendly people were the ones who were serving, and I wanted to know them. So I decided to volunteer, too. And the cool thing is, because I was serving alongside all those people, everybody thought I was that way, too. So that was the one benefit from it. And the other was that when I was having a hard time, I knew all the people who were helpers. And so they helped me. So it was um, something that even though uh, my, in my youth in the Catholic Church, we were encouraged to serve as well, it was often presented as a way to make sure you got a spot in heaven. Now my parents, I know, sincerely served from their hearts. They were two of the most generous, open-hearted people ever. They always welcomed people to our home. If somebody had a struggle, my mom would immediately try to offer help. So they did model that for me. Um, and I knew it had to do with their faith. For me, when I went to college, I did have a struggle keeping my faith. Um, a severe bout of depression during those years, and also looking at the problems in the world. Um, and that was in the early 70s before there was news 24-7, you know, and, and internet. I just saw what was going on, and I thought, how can there be a good God if I feel this horrible with this depression all the time? And how can there be a good God when the world is suffering so much? And I really struggled to, to keep faith at that time. The thing that got under my defensiveness about there being a God was the music. I happened to hear a lot of Christian music at that time, and the words were amazing, but the thing that really got to me were the melodies and the instruments, that nonverbal language of music. So little by little, I found myself opening up to my faith again and realized I really wanted to provide that kind of encounter for others. Um, since I was a trained musician, it was kind of a no-brainer to get involved in music ministry. So in my early 20s, I started doing that. And it was such an amazing experience. The people that I still know from years and years ago, a lot of you, that we've been doing music for so long, and we are family by, because of serving together in that way. But the other thing that happened was there were people that came alongside me and loved me as I was and listened to me and helped me heal from the things that had caused the depressions that I experienced. So I began to learn how important it is to have life-on-life -life contact outside of Sunday mornings. I, I learned that not, I'm not the only one who felt isolated and cut off. And so my commitment to leading small groups began in my late 20s, and so I've been doing that since that time. Um, because it provides a place for getting to know people at a deeper level, a place of growth, a place to pray for one another, a place to um, really be transparent about what's going on, not just putting on that happy face and pretending everything's fine. Um, so that, that is truly where I 
groups love to serve now as a place of helping people get connected to feel part of this of every, any church family should have that but ours in particular feeling part of our church family um, I began to realize too that the way God shows his love to us you know he lives in each of us we're conduits of his love to one another and as you look around the world, the anger and the hatred, I, I really think underneath all that is fear. I, I think there's the fear of I, I'm not seen, I don't matter, and I don't, I don't, no one is going to take care of me. And in that anger, there's in fear, it, it, there's striking out that goes on, and people start hurting one another. Well, in Scripture, it says it's perfect love that casts out fear. Jesus immediately would look at people, let him know, let that person know he loved them before he did anything else. So we, as his light bearers, are to do the same, to let Jesus be available, to let him shine through us, to bring others closer to him. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for sharing about the giving of your time and your talents, truly for shining your light before others. So we have heard from members in our community, and now I turn the question back to us. How are you letting your light shine? How are you sparkling? The good news is this. We are the light of the world. It's us. But that may be the hardest thing to believe about this passage. Perhaps the more important question isn't, how are you letting your light shine? But do you really believe that you have light to shine? And what would happen if you really did believe that about yourself? I know we just sang this little light of mine, but there's a Taylor Swift song that is also about sparkling, and it's called Bejeweled, and I know that some of y'all know it. And she says this, best believe I'm still bejeweled. When I walk in the room, I can still make the whole place shimmer. So Jesus says that we are the light of the world, that we all have sparkle. We all have something to offer, something to give. We shine because God made us that way. It's not a question of our ability to shine. It's the reality of how we're made. We are made to sparkle. So believe this good news and hear this good news. You are the light of the world. You are made to sparkle. God made you to sparkle. Whoever you are, whatever your condition, whatever you have done or have not done, whatever your education or situation in life, your age, or anything else, we are made to sparkle. So how are you letting your light shine? First, let us believe that we have light. And second, we got to let it shine. The church thrives and is able to do the most good when we are a collective light in the world. This little light of mine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So in the name of Jesus, let's light this place up. Amen.